And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Bub and the Bloom, episode 29. A special episode for Ryan and myself tonight. Doing things a little different as we wrapped up our positional recaps of 2022. The baseball forecaster's PDF version just came out for 2023. So we're going to have some, some guests on this episode and the next episode to talk about this year's forecaster, the experiences in writing in it, and what what not and much, much more. All kinds of fun fantasy baseball stuff as it is actually, weirdly enough, turning into draft season. You can find myself on Twitter at BDentric and my co-host, as mentioned earlier, on Twitter at Ryan BHQ. Ryan, how we doing, man? Happy December. Bubba, one one week or one month closer to opening day as this thing comes out. Um, doing good. I, I missed you last week. It felt like felt like a month, you know, when we just missed one week of shows. So I uh, hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Hope the listeners had a great Thanksgiving. Um, it was Every year with the forecaster, I mean, our, our goal is to get it out, get the PDF out um, that day before that Thanksgiving Eve. And it's awesome to kind of not only just hit that deadline, but then to kind of see people get all excited about it when it hits inboxes Wednesday morning. So that was cool, um, but ready to get back into it and talk about the book. And, and thanks to uh, Corbin and Jock. I mean, this is our first, at least with me, you and me, this is our first uh, guest show. So yes, I'm, yeah. I'm excited, man. And you, you teed him up, and we'll give the uh, the veteran the chance first here. You can find him on Twitter at Jock at HQ. Jock Thompson's been writing for many years at HQ. I'm gonna let him have the floor and tell his whole story on this. But Jock, thanks for joining us, man. It's been it's been awesome. I've listened to you on Baseball HQ Radio. I've I've uh, read your work for a long time. But you been you are one of the grizzled veterans, as you said, in in this deal. So. How are you doing? And uh, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm doing great. It's 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 great to be with you guys. Uh, it's been a long ride. I think I've been at this since 2004. I I just God, have you guys been alive that long? Because yeah, maybe is, not Corbin. It's been a long time. <laughs> And awesome. you're still doing it, and you're still yeah. doing it, which is it's uh, changed a lot, obviously, and I've changed a lot, and everyone's changed a lot, and I'm doing different things now. But uh, yeah, it's 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 fun to be with you guys. Podcasting is a lot easier than it used to be. Yeah, yeah. If I always, my joke is, if I can figure it out, anybody can. So it's it's a beautiful thing. It's a lot easier. Um, and our our rookie in the forecast this year, we're not a rookie when it comes to fantasy content. The dude is crushing it in football, baseball. He's all over the place. Many, many, many places. You can find him on Twitter, though, at Corbin underscore Young 21. Corbin Young, how we doing, my man? What's up? What's up? Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we were just talking earlier. Just got a bunch of snow. You know, it's a little unusual for here, but it's all good. And that's all good. And yeah, glad to be able to contribute to the site and the forecast for the first time this year. So so we're going to kind of go back and forth and compare perspectives on the two. We're going to start with you, Corbin, on this one. Um, like you said, your first year is writing at HQ. You were doing some awesome work. Uh, it almost felt like our work came out on the same day every day or something, but uh, each week. But you were just doing awesome um, columns over there at HQ. You're doing the forecast for this year. So digging into the HQ format of the world and all the writings, how was the first year experience between just the regular articles and even the forecaster? That's our main topic tonight. Yeah, yeah, it was a little different. You know, I'm definitely, I kind of dug the idea of the facts and flukes uh, column and stuff of like looking into, you know, five players or whatever and looking at the skills and whether it's real or whatever. But uh, yeah, it definitely, uh, you know, taught me to kind of fine tune my process. <laughs> Sometimes I get a little too wordy or, you know, like digging too deep into something that might not be relevant or something. And so, you know, just just kind of getting some of that feedback and being like, all right, well, you know, and, and I kind of like the format of just like pulling into bullet points. And, you know, as a reader, like I like kind of looking at things like that, just kind of, you know, breaking things down like that instead of the long paragraphs or whatever. But. No, I mean, it's a good team over there. You know, Steven and the rest of the editors there just kind of help through that process and give me feedback and everything just makes it easy so you know it's it's funny you say that because that's one thing i've told ryan so many times about just doing the matchups column i said one thing i love about it because you and i've written it many places is the format it's just like keep it simple like follow the format do these things because that's and it's just it makes writing it more fun it felt like to me and so it's kind of it's interesting here and you say that for a different column but similar concept at hq how was the forecaster though how how was that? You know, you had to deal with a very tough editor, and um, <laughs> I, I know that was a tough deal. So so how did that go for you? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it kind of started. You know, like Ray, Brandon Ray sent me that email of like, "Hey, you want to try this out?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure." I mean, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. It was just like, sounds like a cool thing to do, and let's do it. Uh, you know, so I mean, even before Ryan, you know, I went back and forth a little bit with Brandon <laughs> for some trial stuff and try to see if I was even. <laughs> ready for this task but yeah like i said you know 
facts and flukes already pairs down my process and this really had to pare down even more right it's like three sentences and it's like that's that was kind of hard for me to be just to be honest just there's a process writing wise but like i said you know brian and help with that kind of in that trial process and ryan as well just kind of um, just again just feedback back and forth you know i i know they're spending probably more time than i am and some of the feedback and you know uh comments and stuff which is helpful and just kind of hopefully making that next next copy or next edit a little smoother um but yeah i mean it was it was pretty smooth you know i mean it, just like with anything it just takes a little learning here and there but you know ryan gave a good detailed process of what to expect and that made, meant, that made it pretty smooth and just you know i could reach out to him anytime of you know anything and he just gets back in a reasonable time frame and so it was all good yeah no hiccups, at least I think, but maybe, maybe they're more in his end. Yeah, no hiccups that you think of, Corbin. But really, behind it, no, I'm, I'm kidding. You, you did, uh, you did a great job. I remember, like, it, it, and the forecaster is how I got into fantasy baseball. I mean, in general, in, in terms of writing, and this, I think, this was like 07, 08. So, Jock, you were, you were, you were, you were still writing. Uh, for the forecaster back then but that's basically what got, got me hooked onto hq and then ultimately writing for hq and i remember like similar to you corbin when you got the, like the emails like all right i i'm a little nervous because like this is this is like this is the bible and this is three sentences to to sum up a player and it's 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 not easy at all to 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 get i don't know i guess 50 55 words yeah, yeah. and <laughs> and be able to tell a story of a player what they did in 2022 right for this year's book and what it means for next year so um yeah very difficult stuff but the one thing i will say like with you corbin like you 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 definitely worked very hard at it i know i probably and again i remember this my first time i was writing uh my first box was chris carter i remember this uh you know i remember this like it was yesterday i was working with brandon cruz who's who's one of the editors, my editor at the time. And Brandon was nice about it. I sent in my box and um, he was like, you know, this maybe a day or two passed. He got the email back to him. He's like, this looks pretty good. I have some feedback. And it was like, boom, <laughs> it was like pages <laughs> and pages of notes and things to change and all that sort of stuff. So um, definitely a big learning curve with it. Well, J Jock, that's never happened to you in your in your time at HQ. I'm assuming. So um, you said you used... has. It happened, it happened. <laughs> and this was before Ryan's time. It happened for the first four years. Um, yeah. Brent mm -hmm. Hershey pretty much taught me how to write. Really, I mean, I, I was nice. a decent writer, but this is a whole different different yep. thing. Writing for the for the forecaster, um, and yeah, you don't have a lot of time. You don't have a lot of space to to write the box. Uh, um, Brian, you said I've been writing the forecaster, I think, since 2008. The oldest forecaster I have in my house is 2010, and I was in there, so at least I know that I was writing back then. So it's nice. been at least 14, 15 years. And and Corbin, it, it gets easier. Trust me, it does. The first five, six years, I... I, I see yeah. my... This is my first one. I've got it here. So for, okay. for the for the non for, for the live audience, for the video audience, this is the one that got me hooked. Two thousand eight. So that's awesome. But Ron, Ron's on the back. He's got he's got like non gray hair. Oh, yeah, wow. And then Jock is in the book. So yeah, I keep these. I keep these things with me too. Yeah. The um, the editing makes it just just so much easier. I I Brent and I Brent has been my editor from the get go, and I've developed a a rapport and obviously a friendship with him over the years. Uh, um, and uh, um, his his return stuff, some days I'll do a clean page, some days I won't do a clean page at all. And, and But all of the comments that he makes usually are spot on, so they're well received and, and uh, it's, it's, it's become a lot, lot easier over the past four or five years. Yeah, Brent, Brent's a great uh, editor. He was the one that started editing my stuff out the gate. And I've had many editors and his was one of the most like, good feedback that didn't make you kind of go like kind of get angry at things it was easy to like okay that makes sense yes we can do this okay that's good okay he's very very good like you said of like wording it the right way and, and making like make sense yet not make you feel like a complete idiot at the same time so it's 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 a it's a very that's and that's a tough skill for editors because you know they're looking at a <laughs> bunch of stuff all the time they're just probably fed up with all of it and brent does a very good job with that so yeah that's yeah. Uh, that's awesome in that regard jock uh for you you said you've been with HQ for quite some time. You've been doing the um, the forecaster. Ryan says since 08 in the book he has there. Um, how has the process evolved for you over all this time? Because it, that's one thing that I know we've kind of said already. I enjoy 
the same voices in so many things because you kind of get to know the person through their writing, which is great. Um, but then again, you guys also said in the forecaster, it's like three sentences. So you can't really get your voice out too much. It's so it's kind of a, 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 a go to thing. So how has the process evolved for you throughout time, uh, especially heading into 2023 now? Um, you know, now for me, it's intuitive. Honestly, I, I don't have a, I don't have a lot of feedback from Brent anymore lately. I mean, recently the stuff has flown, has, has, has flowed really well, but you, you develop a a vocabulary and, and, and you, 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 you create your own checklists. I mean, the, the, I, obviously you check the box first. Um, if the player hasn't had a lot of a batch. You can tell that from the plate, the plate appearances. You check roto wire for the progression during the year. You check his monthly stats and the injuries to see when he's been out. You you gather an overview, you know, of everything, and then you start really digging into the stats. And uh, um, you know, I try to do is sometimes you slip up, and we're going to talk about that <laughs> later on. But uh, um, it, it's an interesting process, and it's. It's uh, it's pretty consistent with most of the boxes, but the stats will tell you where to go and all as well. And we will talk about that later. I'm glad you mentioned it too because uh, it's one of the jokes I know Ryan and I make a lot on this show is, you know, we're we're playing a guessing game, so like just you got to we're doing our best to give you the best guess is what it comes down to. So and it's, and when you're writing as many players as you're writing up and Corbin's writing up and Ryan's writing up, you're not going to get them all right. That's for darn yeah. sure. So it's just like the process of it all, and um, that, that's very very funny the way you mentioned that one um i'll ask you this one jock you mentioned you know, it, how it's evolved and it's come kind of a system for you now when you're you're using this book because i obviously i'd imagine you, you check out the rest of the book when you get it each year you play fantasy baseball as you've seen the growth and how you've used the book through time how would you recommend like say maybe a, a first timer that buys the book use the information because there's a lot to take in a lot to take in in that book like, how would you recommend using a like a player box? Use what's in there. Yeah, there is, and and I may not be the best person to ask that question to, primarily because I don't think I play in as many leagues as the average fantasy player does, and and fa- the average fantasy player is playing in different types of leagues, and and mm-hmm. some are start from scratch, and some are keeper. I play in a few keeper leagues. Uh, I do a a I've done the past couple of years the Tout Wars uh, um, uh, draft and hold leagues. Um, but I think it really depends on your playing style, what you're playing and when you're playing. I mean, I normally don't start even thinking about my drafts until February. I look at the book when it comes out. I, I look just to look for players that I know nothing about that haven't been on my teams that I didn't own a share of um, um, that I need to know something about coming up. And I also look at, look at the prospect sections as well. That's a good point. That's a good point. Corbin, for you, Jock talked about how his process evolved over time. He's got like, you know, he goes to his road wire, goes to all these things. For a first timer, when you already said, you know, you like to write big things and you kind of broke it down for facts and fluids, you broke it down even more for this. What was your process like to get all the info you wanted to get in into a three sentence blurb? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it probably started like the, the normal way that I do things. And then, yeah, I think, and then, you know, Ryan and, you know, Brandon would give me feedback on like, Hey, you know, maybe, uh, you know, meant this, we probably wouldn't note this or something, you know, and, or note this instead. And so I think that kind of helped kind of fine tune that. Um, but yeah, normally it's just like looking at the, the surface stuff, you know, any of the kind of look factors or whatever, and seeing if anything's weird from the from the norm and then diving into some of the skill stuff and again seeing if anything's you know weird or abnormal or maybe there's an injury or something or trying to explain some of that and just kind of look through it uh like jock said yeah definitely if there's something weird i'll definitely go to the rotor wire blurbs and it'll be like was this player injured around this time or before this time you know could that have explained some of that um yeah and then just kind of you know, projecting forward, I think is the hardest part is like, you know, I, I think we're pretty good about this in baseball. Like, cause like you said, I do fantasy football for football. It's just like, it's hard to predict like, you know, each week it's like, Oh, how do I, how did I not know this guy was going to score three touchdowns? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. but at least it was like, baseball. it's like, okay, we kind of saw some skills improvement or decline or, or something, you know? Um, so I think, yeah, just kind of projecting forward and not, you know, expecting the exact same thing or, or, um, you know, not, not expecting something to just magically happen. So, uh, but yeah, in terms of the process for the forecast, it was definitely obviously more condensed, right? It was just like, you know, I might, I might look at like 
20 stats, but maybe I should really be paring it down to five or something, you know, or, or noting like just specific ones that are really notable. Um, so that's probably where, you know, just adjusting in terms of how much space I have to write and, you know, what's, what's, what's actually important. So. And I think that's the hard part with a lot of these boxes is that, I mean, you look at a box and there are, I don't know how many columns now there's, but there used to be a lot less shock, but um, there's probably what 15 or 20 different columns in a box. And it is so easy, at, at least for me, um, to fall into a trap of kind of trying to tell a story just through the stats um, and trying to list and cram every single stat you can do in there. And that was one of the kind of things that I was working with Corbin on. One of the things that I struggled with for a few years is really, you know, try to not say, OK, strikeout weight strikeout rate went down or in hqs this is the other complication i guess in hqs case contact rate went up xpx which is you know a power metric went down avoiding kind of just restating what the stats did but um use the stats to kind of build your argument towards what you think of that player for 2023 so like i think that's really that's one of the really hard parts uh, of, of getting a good box written is um is to use the stats yes but use the stats to um, to not just restate them. The reader can kind of you can you can see the stats yourself in the box, um, but use those to kind of prove or you know validate or invalidate what they did in 2022, and then say what it means for for 23. So um, I mean, one thing I'd also add to Bubba what, to what you were asking, Jock, is like if you're a first time reader of the forecaster, would kind of where to go, what to do. Um, cause there is so much like the, the first thing I did and, and I know the word encyclopedia is nothing quick or, or, um, actionable, but it really is that we, we start the book out with what we call the encyclopedia of analytics. And that's, that's the foundation for basically everything we do at HQ. It defines all the metrics that we use in the boxes, um, on the last page of the book gives the benchmarks for all the stats that we use. So you can see what the league average is for each one of these. And then um, I would just dive right into the player boxes and kind of see how we use those stats um, to come to a conclusion on a player. So um, that's kind of what I would do. Another super useful thing you could do as a reader, especially with the PDF using like control F and looking for text is we do a lot of uh, what we call upside and downside projections. And it's, it's at the end of a box. We'll, you know, if something, someone looks really good or whatever, we'll end it with up colon and then what their upside projection is and you can just do a control f on up colon and <laughs> as weird as that sounds um you can uh you can go through and get a pretty good list of all of our upside guys that we like for 2023 if you really want kind of a quick and dirty uh way to do it i like it i like it a lot i mean the encyclopedia is actually pretty cool and you guys have a bunch of different people that help write in there as well i think jock's been in there uh, there's other people that like, give their inputs on different uh, parts of the uh, as terminology and stats you guys use at HQ. So it is a very helpful section for the first timers, that's for sure. Um, Jock, as you continue to write in the, the forecaster, what um, what is kind of like your favorite part about writing the forecaster? Because there's just you know some of it's just you know you're getting back in the groove or you're wrapping up a season because you guys do it so early. Like you're you're trying to talk twenty. 20- <laughs> 23, but you're writing it in November. Like the like World Series is still going on when Ryan was telling me about the like you guys were already handing this stuff out and getting started. Like yeah. you, you, you got we were in Arizona and you guys were writing up stuff already. I'm um, sorry, you brought that up because my favorite part is the break we got in Arizona. Yeah, <laughs> and then I yeah, came I know, man. five more pages afterwards. Yeah, so it's like you guys were already doing this and there's still baseball going on. Like we there, there's all kinds of stuff. So like what 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 is I guess the favorite part for you? I know we're gonna talk uh, different player stuff later, but I guess favorite challenge, whatever you want about having to do the forecast you've done it so much you've had to kind of experience all of it i think the fun part is again and, and, it, and it goes back to my not playing in as many leagues as a lot of fantasy players nowadays playing um is discovering things i didn't know about players and about their stats and about their 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 projection and what what they look like going forward and getting surprised by some of these guys uh um it, it's it, that part of it is is fascinating there's a, a I learned a few things about a few players this time around, and I always do, and that's always fun. Yeah, no, I agree with that. On the work I, I do um, right now, it's starting to open my eyes to a few players. I'm like, oh, really? Interesting. That, yeah. That's very interesting. What about you, Corbin? What was, like, I guess, the, the, the funnest part that you had of doing your first year in the forecaster? 
Um, it sounds silly, but I think just getting the feedback, you know, I'm weird. I, I like feedback. It's like, I want feedback. I'd rather get feedback than no feedback. <laughs> like I'd rather somebody tell me, Hey, fix a bunch of things. And oh, mm -hmm. we just published it. And <laughs> no, 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 no <laughs> things to change. You know, um, I just probably just, you know, being a teacher and just being like, tell me ways to grow, you know, tell me ways to be better. Let's, let's work on ways to be better. Um, no, I think Jock made a good point about finding some things. Like sometimes there'll be a player that like, maybe I didn't have them on my team or something or, or I wasn't really paying attention. And then you're like, really this happened, yeah. you know, or is it kind of for Leffa three twenty dollars season? You know, it's yeah. like stuff like that. It's like, yeah, that was an interesting box for yeah. sure. So, uh, you know, things like that, that kind of pop up, but yeah, I know. The, the no, the no feedback thing is, is funny because kind of how it works and to give kind of a, a deeper peek behind the curtain <laughs> is like, so, so Jock and Corbin are two of, two of our writers who were actually writing the boxers. And then like, so I was Corbin's editor. I also worked with uh, Brian Rudd. Um, I was his editor as well. Um, I go back and forth with, with Corbin and Brian directly on their boxes. And then I, I shoot it up the chain um, to, to Brent and Brent does a kind of a final copy edit, then shoots it up to Ray, uh, to Ray Murphy, who does, I believe another copy edit and yep. adjust the projections. So while Ray's doing, that's another whole piece to this that we haven't really talked about is in addition to just the narrative box, we're also looking at the projections. Well, and Ray talked about it at our live show. Remember how he was that's, trying to yeah, do the projections right. deal. That he is, was, yeah, that was entertaining. That is, yeah, that is, that is right. So then, yeah. So Ray then looks at it and then that goes up to Ron, to Ron Chandler. I mean, his Ron's name is still on the book and he gets the final, he signs off on every mm -hmm. single box that, uh, um, that goes in the book. And so it's kind of like, it's always like a no news is good news thing. Once, you know, once I'm happy with uh, kind of where a certain page is out with Corbin's or with, with, with Rudd's, I send it up to Brent and then you just kind of <laughs> cross your fingers. It doesn't come back to you. <laughs> um, sometimes and I'm sure you've probably seen this jock. Sometimes the box looks a little bit different. I may be, I may be, <laughs> I may be wrong, but this is the first year I think that I haven't had a box completely rewritten by Ron. Because <laughs> <laughs> I always ask him who did it, and I, I always know when it's Ron. I said, "You did this, didn't you?" I said, "Yeah." Nice. It, those are the those are the gems when when it comes out and it's like, "Yeah, I I wrote some of that," <laughs> but some somewhere along that chain of command, it uh, it got it got updated. Um, I know that I, I did. I do know they did, um, and this it makes a ton of sense. Not something we normally do, but I had a few boxes get updated with some numbers about the shift and certain guys that were shifted yes, against. Um, yep. yep. And so that was something that wasn't really on my radar really has never been because it's never been a shift rule change before. Yes. Um, but that was something that got, that got updated a little bit higher up the chain. Any final thoughts on the forecaster from anybody here? Like first times, long times, Ryan, anything before we talk some players here, anybody, anybody got anything? Mm. You're, you're happy to do it. You're yeah. happy that it's over <laughs> at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Perfect. Perfect. Well, let's talk some players. Like I said at the beginning, I picked three players from each of the pages they wrote up. And if we got more to talk about, I know some listener questions will probably cover some more as well. But uh, these are kind of three names that have been talked about quite a bit. Or I know we've talked about them on other shows, trying to like scratching our head and kind of curious about 2023 on these guys. So we're going to go to the gentleman that wrote these boxes and get their thoughts on what they're seeing here. And we'll start with Corbin here. And one of the, the players that he had the pleasure of writing up, well, I assume pleasure of writing up was one Josh young. And this is a name that uh, Rhino Ryan talked about at uh, first pitch Arizona. He was mentioning a few different, different talks there was supposed to miss all of 2022. Then came back and played close to a month to finish the season, uh, maybe a little over a month. And uh, there's some high expectations at one point, the production probably wasn't as great, but maybe there's more to see there. So, Corbin, when you wrote up Josh, what did you see? Is there something to be optimistic for in 2023, or is there still some concerns there? Yeah, I mean, it's a mix of some concerns. Uh, you know, obviously the shoulder surgery in February is something that I'm kind of – I don't want to say discounting, but I'm kind of like, you know, taking into account when I'm like thinking about like him coming back towards the end of the season and, you know, what that looked like. I mean, the strike rate was a little ridiculous <laughs> to stomach there and the batting average, you know, along with that. But I mean, he, he's, he's definitely flashed at raw power, right? He's got some elite power skills in the minors and stuff. Uh, you know, just looking at the track record in the minors, like I, I, 
I'm going to hope that the striker rate is going to be that bad. And, and, you know, so, um, I, 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 ha- I was trying to look back and I had him on TGFBI and I was like chasing some categories and I'll be honest, I probably didn't even realize how bad his batting average was, you know, until I dug into the box of like, Whoa, like, okay. It was pretty awful. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's just, I'm trying to be patient with guys like, uh, you know, and hopefully this kind of came across as like in the box, like trying to be patient with guys like um, like this, especially when they come off shoulder surgery. Um, you know, I think I think especially when we're talking about like some hitters and stuff. Uh, I mean, uh, I, it feels like some hitters might take a little while to kind of fully recover and kind of you know, especially power hitters. I, I kind of think of Eugenio Suarez or something. You know, we had some really low lows, you know, before last year of like pretty brutal. Um, you know, not that it's going to be the same case kind of thing, but I, yeah, I do like Josh Young as kind of like a sleeper heading into 2023. Um, I like, I'm like, Jock, I don't even do any baseball drafts. So I guess, I mean, I did one best ball, but I, it's, I'm all football right now. So it's hard to, it's hard to think about like drafting, but, uh, like he'd definitely be kind of a player that I'd want as like a corner infielder. Um, probably not my starting third baseman, you know, unless I've got somebody that's like, pretty secure there right there but somebody i'm definitely liking um but you know you probably got to eat some poor production <laughs> at start yeah yeah uh, no the, the interesting it, thing yeah. with young's box uh, just real quick bubba is like because we were going back and forth at corbin and i on it it's it's one of the tougher boxes these guys that have like just a little bit of major league experience because what we do in the forecaster is we, we use what we call major league equivalents uh, for minor league, especially the upper minors, anything above double a, we not only include in the book, but we combine those into one year and we, and we kind of scale it down to what um, those numbers would be in the major. So like, for example, with young, he hit 19 homers in 2021, but our MLE uh, for that equivalent in the, in the majors would have been like 14 or 15 home runs. So um, we're trying to kind of take what they did in, in the minors, given the the run scoring environment, given the park and scale that down to what it would kind of equivalently be in the major. So that, that makes, that makes boxes like Josh Young's a little bit um, tricky. And then, yeah, to like what Corbin was saying, the shoulder thing, how much of a pass do you give him? Cause in 2021, the OBP, I mean, we equated to 341 OBP in, in the majors um, that went down to 231 and we're projecting 277, which is pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, but he did have that skill in the upper minors and yeah, like, like Corbin would say, how much of a pass do you kind of grant him for that shoulder problem? He's got an ADP of 203 right now in an NPC 50. So people like him. Hmm. That's the, that's the, you have to pay for him if you want him. Uh, Jock, let's go to you here on one of yours. It's a very fun name because in 2021, Cedric Mullins, you know, the 30-30 guy, everyone loved him. Still had a good 2022. But um, one of the topics on Twitter lately is, wait a minute, he was platooned a lot to finish the uh, second half of the season. And so I'm curious on what you got in this column because I guess I didn't pay close enough. I know he didn't have the greatest second half, but I didn't know that was why as much. And that stood out like a sore thumb to me. So what do you got on Cedric Mullins? Honestly, I I. I agree with the, the Twitter commentary I've seen. The thing that, that fools you about Mullins is he's got 600 plate appearances. So first blush, you're thinking, no, he really wasn't platooned. But yep. the thing that I didn't catch in the uh, in the Cedric Mullen box was that second half uh, performance versus left-handers. That was that was way down if you if you look at uh, oh, yeah. the box. Um, now the interesting thing about Mullins, obviously, like the, the box says, his his power was soft anyway, and and you're really buying the the stolen bases and the, and the contact. Um, a, a guy with his kind of speed is obviously going to beat out a lot of hits that a lot of a lot of owners can't, or a lot of players can't, I, sh- I should say. But uh, frankly, I, if, if I could do it all over again, I would have I would have said something about the risk of him being platooned next year from the standpoint of uh, of. Uh, uh, his issues versus versus left-handed pitchers in the second half. There's a lot of balls in the air there. Um, yeah. Obviously, the, the fences were were moved back in uh, in Camden. He may adjust his plate approach. He was a switch hitter until two years ago, so maybe he goes back to switch hitting again. Uh, who knows? Um, I and this is why, as a reader, you got to read all the boxes. You know, the the, the you've got to read the stats there. The the second half uh, performance versus. Uh, OPSVL um, is really telling and all there. And uh, I, I would be a little leery of him, but I'd probably still pick him um, as one of my top stolen base uh, guys uh, going into next year. 
Well, that's a good point because he's going to run. We know that much. So, you're, and that's a luxury, as we talked about many times, is it, definitely a luxury you want to have. But um, I'm with you on that because I saw the 600 plate appearances too, and I'm like, well, okay, good, we're good, no, no problem. And then you start to dig in deeper. You're like, wait a minute, so there are some red flags for sure. So that was definitely a shocker. Um, when was he? On, on when was he being platooned? Was he being platooned in September or something like that? It was. It seems like because I think Jeff Zimmerman, I think, started the conversation, and some other guys jumped in. It felt like it was kind of like middle to end of August and then into September. Yeah. Okay. It was, so it was super late where it, it wasn't as noticeable, I guess. The Orioles were kind of out of it by then or getting close to out of it. So they weren't in the spotlight anymore. I don't know. But it, when uh, I started yeah. reading the forecast, it was the first box I read of mine and I kicked myself immediately. I said, why didn't you say something about that? That was dumb. But I wouldn't have noted it much. until I saw it on Twitter either. Well, I'm with you. So yeah. that's the beauty of it. You, only, you can only find so much unless yeah. you just have all day like some of these guys do. Yeah. <laughs> so um corbin let's go back to you another fun name is jared clinic uh you know he's everyone's got the hype train for him then he comes up and doesn't produce and then he goes back down he's kind of okay well he went back down this last year and still is just okay he showed signs of life though in september it was september we've seen that for many prospects given not expanded rosters anymore so what were your outlooks and thoughts on jared clinic who people are still kind of thinking this might be the time especially because he doesn't cost as much in drafts anymore yeah, yeah, he's another hard one. <laughs> yeah. Trying to take my uh, Mariners bias out of this too, you know. It's like <laughs> he should have been good. He's supposed to be good. <laughs> That's right. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's just it's just dreadful. Just you know, everything's just awful. <laughs> like just uh, across the board. Like it's really hard to find some optimism outside of some of the small sample stuff. Um, you know, par par's always been there, but you know, struggles against lefties, struggles against pretty much every pitch, fastballs. You know, that's a hard thing. Uh, showed some content rate improvements, but uh, you know, I, I want to be hopeful. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> it's just like, like when you, if your batting average and your OBP and everything, you know, pretty much like just getting on base is going to be awful. Like, I he, he could, like, I think I put this in here, like, he could buoy his value with just like some stolen bases and stuff, but it's just like, it's it's hard to really be confident that this is the time and you know and it's like his adp fell but what did it fall to i was trying to look earlier so like i can show you real quick i thought it was like 200 or so or 240 right now he's 254 and yeah. uh in fbc 50s 12 teamers he did better for a few weeks in september didn't he yep. didn't yeah yeah he, he, he played well in september at least yeah, towards second the half line looks definitely looks better yeah <laughs> it's hard to look worse i was gonna say the floor was <laughs> floor was very low he's using well, the right. basement <laughs> yeah he, i mean he, it, uh, go ahead corbin no i was just gonna say like i guess i would just take a you know double of the second half sure you know and then that might be a win based on what we've seen so far but even that's just like you know I, i'd like a little more <laughs> hopefully yeah yeah i, mean, I hope there's the more thing that stuck out with me with kalanick is like and i mean going back to that theme of like you didn't realize this is like I mean the Homer, the Homer and stolen base combo is. I mean he had seven homers, five steals, and less than two hundred plate appearances last year. Like, if if you prorate that out to a full season, that's a twenty fifteen guy. That's mm -hmm. that's plenty valuable in fantasy. But the way that we kind of ended this box was, um, you know, I, I think prudent in that. Yes, like Kellnick's. OBP and Corbin was mentioning this earlier, 251 OBP. Like, is Seattle mm. even going to give him the chance to get to even 300 play? I mean, you can't you can't have someone with a 250 career OBP in your lineup for that long. So, um, yeah, it's a very very tough box. It, it and again, how do you how do you boil all that stuff down into 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 three sentences? And in this case, one of the rules with the forecasters, anyone who did partial time between the major leagues and the minor leagues that season you need to um, put their MLB stats as your first sentence. So you get even fewer, uh, you get even less space than you normally would with uh, guys like this. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, having to cover both of his goods and bads and all of in between there in a, in a three sentence segment. So good on you. Good on you, Corbin. Um, let's go back to Jock on this one. Another fun one. This is more just kind of a spiteful thing for me because he, I was very angry with his production this season. Um, and I'm hoping for more, but we'll see what, what uh, Jock has to say. Tyler O'Neill, there was hype on him going into 2022. Obviously did not pan out. And he mentions part of the reason why in the box uh, here, but what do you have on Tyler O'Neill, Jock? 
Um, this was one of those where RotoWire was was indispensable. If you if you if you have to go to a player um, and, and look at and track the history, the year history through RotoWire, it'll tell you a lot. It'll tell you when they got knocked out of action, when they came back, how, and, and then you can go back to Baseball HQ to figure out how they did in that first month when they came back. You can see the progression or the regression there. And he struggled with injuries. I mean, he got he got knocked out three different times for 66 days. Um, and when you're doing that, it's kind of hard to get traction, particularly if you've got a the big kind of swing that uh, – that Tyler O'Neill uh, has uh, trying to get that launch angle to the point where he, you know, he had it, he had it last year. Um, the thing that I liked were his August and September power metrics looked good, looked good. They looked normal. Um, health is going to be everything for him. I think he's he's such a big guy, um, and the injuries were a lot of different things: uh, bulky left hamstring, shoulder. Those aren't good hitters or, or good injuries for hitters to have. Especially for a hitter, we were hoping that would steal some bases. That just goes completely out the window at that yeah. point in time. He needs to go on the Aaron Judge yoga plan. That's what he needs to do. Yeah, give up the weights, do the yoga, or at least go work out with Corbin. He'll he'll get you the right way program <laughs> and and see where we go there. I, th- I think you have Tyler. Any advice for him, Corbin? Well, I was gonna say I think I should be taking advice from Tyler O'Neill. Because... <laughs> <Not the other laughs> Ty- Tyler O'Neill coming to a Corbin workout video near you. Right. So, there we go. Football, baseball, and athletic trainer all in That's one. Right. Uh, Corbin, we'll back to you on this one. This is a fun one because um, Ryan's talked about him a few times in conferences and whatnot, and it opened my eyes to Alejandro Kirk, where everyone just thinks, you know, great plate discipline, which it was, uh, you know, good batting averages. But when you really dig in, might be a couple concerning parts. I'm not sure. So what did you see when you looked at Alejandro Kirk? Yeah, you know, elite contact rate, right? So that's going to definitely kind of keep, like you said, batting average floor pretty high. Uh, yeah, I mean, power kind of fell off just with too many ground balls. I mean, he he hit kind of, you know, a decent chunk of ground balls throughout the whole season, but you kind of see that in the first half, second half splits there. I try to look if there's really any injuries. It, there was like a, like a, like a rotor riders, like a hip thing for like a couple of days, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything that seemed like, significant or you know cause him to miss time so it's hard to know about that but i mean you know having a catcher that's gonna get, give you you know a decent mon- bunch of power like good batting average you know rack up a ton of plate appearances like <clears throat> is that's probably what we're, we're mostly looking for you know out of our catcher one or something especially if we got two catchers there um so i mean he's got at least league average power you know even if you know, and he's got good contact skills. So uh, I, I'm d- definitely digging him, but I know there's a lot of uh, fans of Alejandro Kirk, so he might disappear a little sooner than you're expecting. Yeah. No doubt about that. Ryan, did you want to expand on him or have we talked about him enough? We've talked about him enough, I think. <laughs> um, but that, that to, to dig a little bit deeper, one of the points Corbin mentioned, I think we went back and forth on this <clears throat> in the editing process, is like as a general rule of thumb, and we, we, we need to list out injuries throughout the season. Like, and then, and, and like Jock said, Rotowire is great for that, especially like the hack where they, I love that they, they tag any injury related news blur with that little red banner in the background so it's super easy to like skip over the oh he went two for four and you know that sort of thing it doesn't matter um but yes do we do we include that thing on the hip with alejandro kirk and like typically a a major ground ball spike like that maybe something's wrong but we i don't know i i I feel like and i agree with corbin like at the end of the day we leave that hip thing out because it only kind of cost him it seemed like very minor. He left the game was back the next day or a couple of days. So uh, we decided to leave that one out, but yeah, wouldn't be surprised at all if there was some kind of hidden injury with Alejandro Kirk, which I mean, the, the glass half full size of that equation is he'll be healthy heading into next season and go back to that first half ground ball fly ball. Um, the glass half empty is maybe he wasn't hurt and it was some kind of approach change or he's still hurt going into next yep. year. Um, you don't just magically get healthy again in the off season every single time. So, um, so yeah, just wanted to dig on, on that, on, on, on mentioning injuries um, and like Tyler O'Neill, like to jocks box, I, I think was, you know, a perfect time to, to list out those injuries because it definitely did impact 
uh, that power production, which snapped back at the end of the year. So, so yeah, in these boxes, we definitely, as, as our general rule of thumb, include any injuries that they had, especially if it was IL stints. Definitely, if we think it impacted the uh, the performance. Is Byron Buxton's a page long? How, how's that one go? <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Look kidding. Up Buxton. Bad joke. Had, had to think, do it. Had I to do think it. there was something about uh, – what do you say? He just gets a built-in red square and he just yeah. walk away type thing. No, the book's still black and white, so he doesn't he doesn't get get red flag. All right, last but not least, here we'll head to Jock for one more, and this is a name that's all over Twitter today on Wednesday, November thirtieth. Like everyone's talking about Vinny P, the Italian breakfast himself, Vinny Pascantino. If you're curious, follow him on Twitter. He told you what an Italian breakfast was when he was in Italy. He took a picture next to it and he showed you. So <laughs> there you go. But um, what do you have on Vinny Pascantino um, on Jock? He's a fun name, a fun talent. We've seen the good with him, but some people <laughs> think the sky's the limit. So what, what are you thinking when you see him? Yeah, that's. Kind of what I said yeah. in, the, in the in the write up. Uh, I didn't see aside from maybe a you know not many home runs. You, you look at a rookie who's making his debut and feeling his way around, and the play skills are just great. Uh, the the power metrics look promising. It's coming. The exit velocity is good, uh, and he was like I said, he 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 managed pitchers from both sides. Uh, I I just th- and I think the Royals lineup is is probably just going to get better. Um, um, they've got a lot of good young hitters um, coming through. I, you know, maybe next year isn't the year that he breaks out, but it's coming. And I, I would want to maybe take a chance on something like that based on his metrics. Yeah, no, he looks, he looks legit. Like, there's a lot to like about that guy and a lot to like about a lot of the young Royals players. Yeah. So uh, they, they have some fun at least coming their way. Man, I won a lot of games, but they'll have some fun. And Vinny P should be a part of it. Um, before we move on to listener questions, I'll give you guys the floor here. Were there any players we did not discuss that we might not discuss shortly that you really enjoyed writing about that kind of, I guess, surprised you more than anything? Like names that stood out. I'll start with you, Corbin. Was there anybody that you wrote up that really kind of like made you go, wow, I did not know that about that player? Uh, I mentioned him a little bit, but Isaiah Kiner for Leffa, you know, like three straight $20 seasons. Um, you know, I mean, I've had him in a couple spots and it just like felt like it was, it was like, dead value you know like just like oh like if i'm not getting a stolen base here you know if i'm not getting batty average like what am i doing here but i mean it just kind of shows that like you know having it some stolen base guys like that is you know necessary part of the game <laughs> i felt boring like I was chasing, simulator boring yeah simulator. <laughs> like i felt like i was chasing seals like all year in a couple spots and it's like maybe i just seem to be better about that not not necessarily meaning you're gonna go full ikf but <laughs> It's like, you know, if you find that boring accumulator guy that's stealing a ton of bags, just, yeah. What, what about you, Jock? You know, the, one of the fun ones that I had to write about was Jeremy Pena, who obviously had a really good good rookie season, but he fell off in the second half. He, mm-hmm. I, I, I watch a lot of uh, AL West and actually West Coast games, obviously, being out here. If, if I'm channel surfing around eight or nine, those are the games on, and they play a lot of their games on West Coast time. But I watched him chase pitches down and away out of the zone constantly in the second half. His batting average wasn't very good. And the reason it was fun to write about him is that it's something that I knew. I watched and I looked at the stats and it mirrored it. And then he gets into the postseason. They're not (laughs) pitching him like that anymore. They're not throwing him stuff out of the – he only walked twice in the postseason. He struck out 15 times, but they're not throwing him breaking stuff out of the zone. It was one of the worst pitching – the worst scouting reports and carry through I've ever seen like that based on what he did in the second half. It was, it was interesting. Funny, funny add on to that. I love when you're writing guys up cause we're doing this and while the postseason's going on. I, I remember to this day, I had David freeze's box back oh, when man. he had his David freeze moment. <laughs> and I remember I just, I just crapped all over him in the forecast. I was like this, this guy is terrible. The skills are not there. And then he wins the World Series um, and does yeah. that after I wrote the box, which doesn't really change the outlook on yeah, him. Yeah, but, yeah. but it is um, it is a little bit nerve-wracking to write about guys that are still playing. And, yeah, like Pena obviously went off in the World Series and, and did that. So I was the guy in the bar in Arizona sitting on the couch yelling, throw him a ball and away. Throw him <laughs> oh, that was you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh, it's funny how these uh, people are very analytical, and then when it comes to when it matters the most, they forget. Hey, just do the thing that works easy, throw it away. <laughs> but uh, it's wild, wild stuff there. Um, 
couple listener questions here. Uh, a couple forecaster ones, non-forecaster ones. We'll start with our buddy Breaking Ben underscore T, who uh, says, do you think there's any chance the Gladiator ADPs will skew DC main event drafts at all? You guys aren't drafting yet, so that's fine. Cause, and this Gladiator is a wild, yeah. wild format. Ryan, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> So to give to get so this is a this is a new format. So yeah, to give some kind of con- context to folks that aren't used to what this gladiator thing is, is basically it's an NFBC contest. It's it's a twenty three round. Um, I call it a best ball. I mean, I, technically it's not, but you you draft your starting twenty three, and, and that's it. your twenty three for the season. You don't change lineups. Mm-hmm. You don't. It's pure just draft, and then you're and done. Pray you stay healthy. And pray, yeah, and right. that's why it's that's. that's yeah, and that's why it's called the Gladiator. Is like basically a lot of these teams are just gonna be torn to shreds by the end of the season. Um, so the big, at least from what I, I have not done these yet. Um, I'm sure I probably will very soon, probably in December. Breaking my promise to wait until January. Who, who would do that? Yeah, who would who would do that one mm-hmm. day early, Bubba? Mm-hmm. Thought you were gonna hold out for December, but mm-hmm. that's okay. Um, one of the big things with this glass, since you can't make any moves, is closers are getting pushed up like crazy because yep. you cannot obviously pick up any closers. You can't really even speculate on would be closers. Maybe your last pick or two. Um, but again, that's taking up starting spots from other guys on your team. So we are seeing Edwin Diaz go in the first round. We're seeing Emmanuel Class A go in the first round. We're seeing Josh Hader go 20th overall. We're seeing Liam Hendricks go 24th overall. So that group, that like top eight to 10 of closers are going in the first three rounds. I've seen teams that have started the first and second rounds or their second and third with two closers. Um, so uh, that's kind of the impetus. I, there's probably other ADP trends, but I think that's the big one. Uh, that's the big, I'm probably, that's the very I'm big one. Missing something. No, um, Diaz went as high as fifth in a draft. Fifth. Wow. Just put that yeah. in perspective. Um, and, and to answer Ben's question, it no. will skew it if you don't filter properly because, exactly. yep. um, because I saw some people tweet stuff out today and they realized it and they're showing the compare the differences in ADPs for relievers and you could see it all right there. And, um, yeah, you need a filter. It's all I'm going to say filter. Um, and you'll get through that one real quick. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's talk forecaster. Our buddy, Mike Carter, the doc, um, he says for each of you, so we'll start with, with jock and then go to Corbin here. Um, well, I guess we kind of answered this already. Never mind. Or maybe not. What box that you wrote surprised you the most, either good or bad, Jock? I think one box that really surprised me a lot was Max Muncy because, I, again, I didn't have him on my team, and uh, I did not realize fully the extent of his UCLA rehab that he was going through during the first half. That really, if, again, you go through the roto wire injury page and you look at the fact that he was out with elbow inflammation in May and you look at that low batting average and then you look at those power metrics and you look at when all this stuff started to come together and perk up just a little bit, you realize he may not have been quite as bad as he sh- he, he, he's probably better than he was last year without an injury. I should have known something was up because the Dodgers re-signed him in, uh, in August, but obviously not being on my team, I wasn't worried about Max Muncy at then. But that's the nice thing about the forecaster. You get in, you dig. Um, I like Max Muncy for next year if he stays healthy. Yeah, I'm starting to kind of buy into that with you. Uh, Corbin, what do you got for us as a surprise for you? Um, I know Ryan kind of <clears throat> mentioned this or talked about it before, but yeah, Aaron Judge, you know, five more expected home runs than actual home runs, and just just so oh. so 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 ridiculous. Like, it's like again, I, I think I was into him the year before and didn't do it this year, and it's just like you 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 don't realize how ridiculous it was he's in the ad, mm-hmm. um, you know. So, uh, but that that would be the main one. Yeah, right. that expected oh. home run. So that's like it's a stat cast measure, basically how many home runs you should have hit based on exit velocity and launch angle. And um, yeah, that was nuts. And and the crazier thing was Judge's second half. It was 37 expected home runs. So like <laughs> that's insane. I, I mean, it's just and expected home runs is park neutral. Yeah. So you would think he'd have even more. Uh, I mean, I know he's right handed in Yankee Stadium. It's not as good for righties as lefties. But I mean, he he could have challenged 73 uh, according to our expected metric 
uh, crazy. which is yeah, which is just crazy. So that's that's a fun one. He had one of those years for the ages, and someone's going to overpay for him. Hopefully, not San Francisco. Um, and our last question we have is our good buddy Will Garofalo says. Uh, is there any player box you produce that you feel especially good about? Can be positive or negative, but hey, let's go positive. Uh, bonus: How did you catch yourself in your overanalyze on a player? So we'll go to Corbin on this one because he talked about the overanalyzing part earlier. So I want to go on to this. Um, was there uh, any box you felt really proud about? Like this was the one I crushed it. And his other question was: How did you catch yourself in overanalyzing players? Uh I don't know about crush any box, but well, <laughs> I'll, just talk, I'll, just, box the best I'll just I'll just talk about a player that I feel really good about that it just happened to you know have here in this one of the boxes. Uh Edward Cabrera. So yeah. uh just kind of looking at it, you know, a lot of injuries, uh not, not just you know, not just last year, but in the you know, throughout the minors and stuff. Yeah. Um he, you know, he increased the change of usage, uh, you know, better swing and strike rate, just a lot of good things there. Um I like to buy into Marlins pitchers. Um, you know, last year I was all in on Jesus Lazardo and stuff like that, though he was a lot he was a lot worse than we saw with Cabrera. But no, I think uh that's one uh, one guy that I'm really liking that I just happen to have the box for uh, that I that's positive and I feel feel good about. Uh oh how do I catch myself or analyzing? Um I don't, Will. I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I catch uh, it. Yeah, Ryan catches it. All the editors yeah, catch that's it. What editors <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, I yeah, I tend to kind of overanalyze, uh, and so I, I'm trying to be better at it. I think I'm a little better at it since I started this, but just yeah, just trying to be a little better at it um, and balancing. You know, just w what what would I be interested in reading and not just dumping a bunch of information <laughs> on them. So. All right, Jock. Which uh, which box do you feel you produce that you you really did especially good with? Yeah, I. You know what? Um, um, I, I honestly can't. I, I thought Jeremy Pena was my easiest box to write about simply because I watched him all season and the stats just fell into place. Mm -hmm. um, the one box I thought I'm, I don't know if I crushed it or not, but but the one box where I covered all the bases and I think is a real interesting name next year, particularly as a, as a trade candidate, is Sean Murphy. He had a real interesting year metrics wise, underlying metrics. The, 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 the stats, the surface stats weren't outstanding. But when you think about the lineup he played in in the home venue that he played in, you, you trade that guy to a contender where he may, may worry, very well end up even before opening day. Um, he's a real interesting guy. And I know catching, catching seems loaded to me and it's a real interesting. Even the number two catching spots are, are just very, very interesting. Um, there's a guy that that kind of opened my eyes a little bit with his metrics and and his performance playing for a, a just a horrible team. That's an interesting upside. You, yeah, you ended it with an upside 275, 25 homers. That's um, I can see it looking at the box. I haven't, I haven't gotten to him yet, Murphy yet in my own prep, but that's that's a good looking one. Yeah, yeah Mur Murphy's a fun one. I was just doing something on him the other the other day, and there's. Some interesting things to like about Mr. Murphy there. So I, I'm yeah. with you on that. There's, as far I, I like as open that, like analyzing that stuff, I just I, – some boxes just you just get writer's block. You just can't do yeah. anything, you know, with your – particularly if you're, you've got to write about a player like um, – oh, who, who was the third baseman for the A's, Brian, uh, that was up early in the year? Uh, uh, I have his oh. name. So oh, know, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Everyone was all excited. Yeah. Kevin Smith? No, uh, not, Smith not or Kevin. Brown or not Kevin Sheldon Sheldon Noise. Sheldon Noisy. Oh, Sheldon yeah. Noisy. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, he had like a forty-seven percent hit rate in spring training, yeah. and then Kevin yeah. Kevin got Kevin Smith got hurt, and he yeah. was the first baseman for about a month, and he did real well, and then everything fell apart. And you obviously have to talk about him because he had a lot of the bats on a team, yeah. but he shouldn't have, and you know, yeah. figure the, out a. The kind of easy funny, answer is he wasn't that good. Don't draft him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's like, and and I know Corbin, we, we went back and forth on this a lot. Like, you had a lot of middle relievers. I think everyone has a lot of middle relievers. And it's just, it's very hard to wrap up a middle reliever box, especially if they don't have, like, closer-worthy skills. Um, like, what do you write about? I had, I had Phil Bickford, like, <laughs> as a box. And um, I mean, nothing against Phil Bickford or Bickford's family or, or whatever. Um, A lot of listeners, we know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
but like what yeah those are the ones that are hard for me at least yeah uh, good stuff all of us well, I'm looking forward to reading more of The Forecaster, as always. I know everyone else is, too. But before we leave, Ryan, you have any final thoughts or anything else for these fine gentlemen that joined us this evening? No, I appreciate trading, trading war stories. It really is a um, – it's it's a grind from really that last day of the season up until, yeah, we get that, like, three- or four-day break in Arizona for those of us lucky enough to attend. Uh, but it's basically all out until mid-November. So um, thanks for that. Chuck and Corbin. Uh, Corbin, great first year for you, man. And thanks for chatting it up with us tonight. No, thanks for inviting us, guys. This was fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's good to chat with you guys. It's an yeah. amazing group effort. That's for sure. Yeah. You guys do do a heck of a group effort. It's definitely a great way to put it because it is a big group that makes that thing happen, come to fruition. So for those of you that haven't checked it out yet, well, then you haven't listened to the show. Now, we talk about it all the time. But go ahead, get your forecast for Baseball HQ. Ryan will tweet it out many times from the Baseball HQ account. Uh, make sure you check out Jock on Twitter at Jock at HQ. Corbin is at Corbin underscore Young 21. Ryan at Ryan BHQ. And I'm at BD Entrick. And until next time, thanks for listening to another episode of Bubba and the Bloom. Catch you guys later. <laughs>